welcome, no my haere mai, um, uh, ki te nei hui o te, te kaunihira a rohe o te matau a Maui. Welcome to the Hawke's Bay Regional Council uh, meeting of the 26th of April. Um, may I please hand the rākau over to you, Piri, to resume um, our day with a blessing. We have public out there, do we, John? We do. We have a lot of people who are here. We have a lot of people who are here. We have a lot of people who are here. We have a lot of people who are here. We have a lot of Just acknowledging that in amongst us we have a special, I wouldn't say guest, uh, but we have. Um, Bill Bayfield, uh, and its appropriate uh, chair on your behalf, and certainly within our public viewing. Kimi hiki a koe ra e Bill, no re ra piki mai ka ke mai. No mai hai re mai, kai re waki te nei te kone ra atuhe ata matawa Maui. Welcome uh, with all that you bring uh, into the midst of Hawke's Bay Regional Council. Ne ki ra te nui nui uh, o tēnā uh, pukenga, tēnā mātauranga, tēnā e koe e hoi koea, kairungu ki tēnā kaunihira, kairungu ki tēnā kaunihira. Ne ki ra uh, te whangātoi uh, o tautahi, uh, maunga tito hea taranaki, uh, just acknowledging previous places uh, where you have been uh, Chief Executive of no, Bay of Plenty, down in Environment Canterbury, uh, also in Taranaki, and of course more recently with Taumata Arawai as the inaugural uh, Chief Executive. Nō reira, ana reira mātou, e ki rā ngā kai kaunihira, tai hoki rā ki tēnei ngā kai mahi, katoa, te toru rau a me te rimutakau e noho kei runga ki tēnei whare. Acknowledging on behalf of our councillors and also uh, our 350 staff uh, who are here uh, to welcome and support you uh, and the role that you will hold until such time uh, that Dr Nick Pete takes up in early July. Acknowledging those that have passed on. Koutura o tēnā taiwhenua tēnā takiwa o tamatia. Ko angaro nei tēnā rangatira o koutou e kia nei ko tēnā tohunga o te ki, tēnā tohunga o te kupu, tēnā tohunga o te karakia, a J.B. Hepiri Smith. Tēnei te mihi ki o koutou o tamatea me ki rā tēnā engaro nei rā i o koutou, e haere ki tua o pai o maumahara, kia rā tau. Tini te mano kaituat, acknowledging the passing recently uh, of uh, J. B. Smith, um, very renowned uh, tohunga and master in his own right in terms of the way that he was brought up, and many of our staff, uh, actually most councils, actually attended down at Ako Tatahi uh, last week. Tene te mihi kiko te o tamati e miki rai o tato katoa, katira koto ki a koto. Hoki atu. Hoki mai rā kia tātou te hunga ora e pikau hea i ngā maumahara ngā, ngā tūmana ko kari anu i oti. And there lies for us the living in terms of ensuring the aspirations of those past uh, are achieved. Uh, hoi anō e te tia mana, tātou katoa, me noi tātou. We want to do our karakia. Uh, it's one bill that you might be familiar with. It comes from Taranaki, by the way. Uh, and um, uh, I'll leave all the volume here for the councillors and for our staff. Whakataka te hau ki te hu, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai, e hi a kiana te atakura, he te o he uka, e hau hu, si hei maori ora. Nā tēnā koe. Nā tēnā koe, Piri, I am... 
Me mihi katika kia koe and tautoko, tautoko to korero. Welcome, Bill, um, into our organisation, into tina te te kaimihira arovi o tina te wānaui, uh, tina koe. Kia ora. Um, kia ora to everyone joining us, um, councillors, staff, online, um, and invited guests uh, today. So. Uh, Please, uh, apologies. Uh, do we have any apologies to note? Katarina Kawana? Uh, I believe she's supposed to be coming on. Oh, she'll come online? Please, sir. Tanya Hopmans. Um, are there any other apologies? If there are none, I'm happy to Chief, move. I understand it was Tanya Hopmans as well as Kiri Ropiha. And Kiri Ropiha, thank you. Happy to move those. Can I please have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Sears. All those who agree, say aye. Aye. Those against, carried. Kia ora. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping, given, uh, given we had an earthquake earlier uh, this morning uh, affecting uh, Porangaho, but we hear that they're, they're doing well at this stage. So in this meeting, it is live streamed on our Council Facebook page um, and recorded for viewing at a later date on our YouTube channel. And in a, the event of an earthquake, drop, cover and hold. If the shaking is long or strong, when shaking subsides, leave the building through the nearest exit and proceed immediately towards Napier Hill along Dalton Street to Tiffin Park. Uh, evacuation, if in an emergency alarm sounds, immediately evacuate the building through the nearest exits and proceed to the assembly area on the grass on the corner of Dalton and Baltier Streets. Um, and in an evacuation, <coughs> emergency exits are clearly signposted. Okay, Fari Paku, just uh, out the door down the, down the hallway, follow the signs. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa. So, uh, moving on, conflict of interest declarations. Are there any for the items in today's council meeting? There are none, thank you. Confirmation of minutes from the 29th of March. Are there any alterations to be made? Councillor Williams. <coughs> thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm sorry to bring this up again, but we still haven't got the terms of reference for the original transport committee recorded correctly. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to be a pedant on this because there was a full discussion about it on 16 November and at the RTC on 10 February. The wording is uh, promote and plan for active transport in the region. So those, that wording needs to be amended to that. Thank you, Councillor. Item six, promote and plan, plan for, for active transport in the region. I just want to check that, uh, that the end's got that. The end? Oh, so, I've, yeah, okay. I see that now. So it's supposed to be promote, promote and, and plan, plan for. for. Active transport in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. There are no other um, edits to be made. Can I please have a mover of those minutes and a seconder? Councillor Williams, Councillor Hukianga, all those who agree say aye. 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 Those against, carried. Kia ora. Uh, call for minor items not on the agenda. Uh, Councillor Roadley. Uh, could I add to the agenda, please, a discussion around how well poised the organisation is to service our, the wider reaches, reaches of our region? Okay, servicing. Yeah, servicing outer region, outer outer regions, outer outer reaches of the region. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any other minor items? Thank you very much. Uh, we move on to our decision items. So item number five, the independent review, Hawke's Bay Regional Council flood assets performance during Cyclone Gabriel. Um, who would like to lead this paper? Susie, are you the author? Uh, yeah, I can lead uh, with Penny, if you'd so like to. Tag, yeah. Tag team, do you want me to start, Penny? Uh, so the purpose of this paper I presented today is to uh, 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 ultimately, I guess, uh, receive uh, agreement from the council to proceed with an independent review uh, of Hawke's Bay Regional Council's owned and operated flood assets and drainage schemes. Uh, this is proposed uh, outside of any other review going on across Hawke's Bay, i.e. Uh, that indicated of the sedum function. 
Uh, but given the desire to provide uh, our ratepayers and community with sort of transparency around our flood protection assets, <coughs> how and why they perform during Cyclone Gabriel uh, is of utmost importance to us. So this independent review uh, outline is quite broad in its nature uh, on purpose. You'll see that in the proposed terms of reference. Um, and at this stage, uh, the independent review <coughs> will look at all of our flood schemes, including the drainage. And I think that's really important that we uh, mm -hmm. that I highlight, including the drainage schemes uh, for transparency around how they performed. It's proposed the independent review has an independent panel uh, this review is very similar to that uh, undertaken in Bay of Plenty uh, post-floods by Sir Michael Cullen, uh, and what we are proposing uh, in this review will run a similar independent panel of experts, of which are yet to be uh, appointed. Uh, however, you will note in the recommendations that we are seeking to appoint uh, Philip Mitchell as the chair of that independent panel. Alongside the proposed review, uh, we are proposing uh, this is the first time you will have seen this in uh, terms of reference. Uh, so as such, we are proposing that finalisation of that is made with the next interim CE, uh, Mr Bill Bayfield, who will start formally next week. Uh, and we are seeking your approval to, uh, to allow Mr Bayfield to confirm the terms of reference. And if there's anything material changes with the scope, uh, we would bring that back to Council. Thank you, Susie. Um, and I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, thank Councillor Williams uh, for your input into this original scoping um, and shaping um, parts of this on behalf of the regional uh, councillors here. Um, also, just to uh, comment that this review is uh, not about apportioning blame, um, that it's about taking the learnings and understanding uh, the event that occurred and its impact on our flood protection assets and schemes. Um, and in terms of the learnings that come from that is, is for us to look at the improvements uh, and the investments in our long-term protection and safeguarding our communities into the future. Um, so given that, I will hand it over to um, Councillor Williams uh, to, to comment and uh, start us off with questions. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> Before I comment, I just thank you, Chair, uh, and for that acknowledgement. Um, it, there's just one question I had, and it's to the extent to which options two and one, before I comment, is say, uh, are mutually exclusive um, in the sense, a uh, question for Chris, I guess, if we were to do option one, do we still need to do option two, or can some of the internal staff work that would feed into an external and consultant peer review uh, equally feed into an independent peer review? Yep. So I think uh, both pieces of work are necessary, but some work by staff would be multi-use, so it would be useful in both reviews. I certainly see the first review uh, as quite wide-ranging across the whole of the region and all of our schemes, and allowing for public participation and public comment. Then the option two is much more of a technical review where we're looking at a um, very, very detailed look at the two big schemes, how they're operating, uh, how they responded. We may indeed take on any recommendations or early recommendations out of the, the greater scheme. And we're fundamentally looking uh, to redesign the scheme so that in an over-design event, it behaves in a known and controlled way which may or may not be achievable, but that's something uh, we're certainly looking for. Uh, and that will then set up um, you know, funding and LTP discussions uh, going forward. So I see them as quite, quite different, very detailed, very focused versus an, an overview with public participation. But certainly the, the technical work staff are doing may be used in both of those reviews. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Look, um, if you'll forgive me, councillors, and there may be other councillors who have questions as well, but I just wanted to set the scene with this, and if I could just be given a bit of a time, bit of time to do that, perhaps more than the normal five minutes, but I'll try to be no longer than ten. <coughs> in essence, where I want to start from is the, is the acknowledgement that Cyclone Gabriel, and I've got this written down, <coughs> has had an impact on the region, its environment and communities at a scale and of an extent which is unprecedented during the life of this organisation. And this impact reflects the unprecedented scale and intensity of the cyclone itself. 
We as an organisation have statutory functions uh, relevant to the event, including in relation to natural hazard risks, climate change adaptation, and the ownership and operation of our flood protection schemes, our control and drainage and maintenance schemes in place within the various river catchments in the region. And in addition, we have established, as funded through this long-term plan, river-level monitoring and telemetry communication systems that were intended to better prepare the region for uh, to, to respond. Now, as I see it, and I, I know my colleagues share this, our communities have a legitimate expectation that a thorough investigation of the causes and effects of Cyclone Gabriel on them, as relevant to our functions, will be carried out by the organisation in order to answer the very many questions that have been put to us as elected representatives and to our staff since 14 February as a matter of accountability. And equally, they have a legitimate expectation that they would have an opportunity to directly input into that process. Now, the staff, as Chris has just shared, are progressing a number of internal reviews on work streams that would feed into a review of this kind. <clears throat> on the other end of things, if you like, we're aware that <clears throat> excuse me, there may be a national review of civil defence, and that the region is standing up a civil defence review uh, of how that, op that operated during the cyclone and learnings, as uh, Chair Ormsby shared, uh, for the future. This review is not intended to duplicate those processes. It is intended to align with them as seamlessly as possible. And I, I would submit that it would equally better position the organisation to participate, uh, particularly in terms of a national review on civil defence response, when we have a full understanding independently peer-reviewed of how our assets that we have specific responsibility for are performed and what could be done about it. The review has a precedent in the Rangatiki uh, scheme review, chaired by Sir, Sir, uh, Sir Michael Cullen. Uh, that review was reasonably affordable, completed in an effective and common sense way, including with direct engagement uh, of affected communities. So, to put that all very simply, this was a big deal. Two, this is our job, our core business. And three, we owe this to our communities uh, in terms of transparency, accountability, uh, and uh, an opportunity for community voice. So just on community voice, <clears throat> I'd like to see personally, and I know this is being delegated to uh, Bill, but a combination of both one-on-ones between the panel uh, with community groups, and a number of community groups are being stood up directly, that they could just go and meet uh, with marae uh, in, in affected areas and with stakeholders. In addition to that, uh, in addition to an opportunity for written submissions of the kind that you would have from a long-term plan or an annual plan or a public transport plan. Um, and it's that combination that I think would, would provide an opportunity for, the, for as we know as councillors, and, and going to a community meetings and, and talking to people who have been affected, there's 10,000 stories out there. Every one of those is valid, and, and they, the, those members of our community should be entitled to share them. There's a lot to learn from those who experienced this directly, as uh, uh, Chair Ormsby and Councillor Van Bay can testify. Mm. Um, so, yeah, just, I guess, the CEO is being requested to, re to refine the terms of reference, and I think there's a bit of finessing, perhaps, on uh, the most logical, straightforward and sensible structure to enable community voice, perhaps with a draft report <coughs> um, that, that the community could speak to at some stage. The next thing I just wanted to touch on, a couple more points, is, is Dr Phil Mitchell. Uh, there have been some preliminary discussions to determine his availability, willingness and competence um, to, to undertake this review as a resource management uh, professional. Uh, I, I can uh, assure our communities and my colleagues that Dr Mitchell is at the very top of the pile, pack, pack, uh, perhaps would be a better word, uh, top of the pack, <coughs> in terms of uh, professional uh, mana, and professional um, experience. Uh, he's got, uh, got a PhD as a doctor. He's a trained engineer. He uh, has sat on the recovery panel for Canterbury in terms of their recovery plan. Uh, he's very familiar with uh, fair uh, hearing processes. Uh, he has a very common sense demeanour. Uh, he is extremely intelligent. Um, and he has, I think, the combination of demeanour, intellect, skills, 
empathy, fortitude and resolve to, to do this job extremely well. So the recommendation is there that he be appointed as chair, uh, and I support that. I have to be honest, he's not, and he'll acknowledge this, he's not the big name. He's not Sir Michael Cullen. He doesn't stand up to be uh, either of those things. Um, but do we want someone who is in substance able to competently uh, chair this panel in a way that I think the community will come to respect, or do we just want a, a big label and a big name that we pull in uh, for its own sake? So I'm, I'm certainly in the former camp. Uh, the next point is that there must, as I touched on, be quite a, a, a very careful alignment between this review and the CDM review that's being initiated within the region. And I encourage, as I know my colleagues do as well, uh, Bill to, to liaise with Doug Tate to ensure mm -hmm. that uh, there is uh, a seamless uh, integration between this review and the CDM review, uh, that there is no gap in the middle and, and no overlap. So it's not intended to overlap the CDM. Um, <clears throat> and we will need to be very careful with the public that they understand which forum they want to talk about. If it's about warnings and it's about the response on the ground uh, in the days after that CDM, if it's about our assets and how they were formed or didn't, or what they were designed to do and for the future, that's the review this one's, this one's talking to. But I guess at the end of all of that, and alongside our recovery plan, we could have from the CEO um, later in the year a synthesis report that feeds into our long-term plan and enables us to resource the recommendations uh, we're not covered by central government. <clears throat> Two more points and then I'm finished. There are some amendments to the terms of reference which I'd like to propose, and this is where uh, our governance staff may want to pick up the pen or anyone else. <coughs> uh, firstly, acknowledging the point um, at paragraph... Um, well, no, I'll start that again. I, I think we need to include under item one, to review the performance of HBRC, etc., etc. After the word drainage schemes, we need to add the words including associated telemetry and stream monitoring assets. Um, so I will be moving at the end of this ramble um, that we amend, that we adopt those terms of reference for uh, completion by the Chief Executive with the additional words after. Uh, schemes including associated telemetry and stream monitoring assets. I know that we're doing our review, but in the same way as Chris just shared, that doesn't mean that that information can't feed into this review, and people, uh, the, the panel shouldn't um, be able to consider that information and make recommendations relative to what the community says about all of that. They may have some other ideas for how um, stream flow levels are, are monitored. Um, and I know I do. Um, two is that uh, recommendation or item two of the terms of reference review scope is to recommend improvements to scheme levels of service, uh, maintenance or operation for future events. I think um, there may be cause, and I'm sure one of my colleagues at least will comment on this, for the addition of the words or any new or additional schemes um, after the words future events, so that would be or any new or additional schemes. There may be communities who say to us, it's not just a matter of going from one and two in the ESC or um, whatever <coughs> um, other catchment of concern, but actually we need a whole new scheme. Um, the final thing I wanted to say in terms of the recommendations, so that's those two points from the terms of reference itself, on the recommendations in the paper, I think we need a, a new six um, that we direct uh, that any material changes to the review terms of reference or the panel appointments be brought back to council for further resolution. And that touches on the point Susie made that, uh, you know, Bill's been given a, a, a brief here, but in his inquiries, his discussions with the staff, his discussions with stakeholders, including central government, may reveal a different approach uh, on terms of reference and panel makeup. And that means we, we haven't foreclosed ourselves from making a later decision that uh, is uh, different to this, which may be needing to be done in short order. So that would be uh, a new six. And so to conclude, uh, I think that this, uh, this would be a proportionate response. It's not a full-blown commission of inquiry. It would be a process that is fair, that is independent, uh, that is robust, uh, and that is public-facing. 
And with that, I, um, yeah, I commend the recommendations in the paper subject to the points I've made. Thank you, Chair. Good, Councillor Williams. Thank you for that. Um, I will open it up for any other questions and then we'll come back to the <coughs> motions. Questions or comments? Councillor Curtin. Um, well, Madam Chair, if you could, you, you could give some leeway in terms of this inquiry, uh, mm. which is really aimed at um, clarifying that the recommendations that we are considering, the resolutions we're looking here, uh, are not uh, curtailed or contained in an unintended way. Um, uh, firstly, I though, want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Councillor Williams, for um, essentially orchestrating to where we've got at the moment, and particularly for the um, level of inspiration around uh, a review chair, mm -hmm. uh, and concur with his view that uh, it is essential that we get to the nub and the truth of the matter, as opposed to any other uh, exterior uh, view on this. So we really want to get down to to, to uh, what we need to do better and differently in the future, and that's just what it's about, just that, nothing more. It's about what we can do better. Um, where, um, and I just want to be clear on this, um, Madam Chair, uh, I was somewhat um, taken aback by the notion of an exclusion for uh, telemetry and telecommunications networks, uh, given that's a central element of our asset management approach. I couldn't see the logic of excluding that. So. I'm assuming the uh, amendment that um, Councillor Williams has foreshadowed mm -hmm. uh, is accommodating that, um, uh, together with um, uh, perhaps um, the other element that um, is somewhat unstated, and I totally appreciate the, um, uh, the preparation of the, t of the terms of reference, needing to get this up in front of Council as quickly as we can. Um, I, I, I'm really keen to see um, that we examine closely uh, the level of risk assessment that has been made on a, made on a catchment by catchment basis. When I review uh, <coughs> the, the evidence in front of us, we've uh, we've got very uh, distant and long past uh, reports coming to us in a technical nature about our catchments. Um, one of the things that I thought is essential, and maybe the thing we have overlooked, is investment and in research in our catchments um, to, to fully understand. Uh, the risks that we've faced and, have, and will face in the future, uh, more acutely so given uh, the prospect of climate change. So I just wanted to be clear on the, uh, the opportunity for um, Mr Bayfield to um, uh, work with the terms of reference so that we can capture essential elements. I'm not suggesting going uh, uh, as broadly as... Um, as, as uh, you know, to include everything in the world, but uh, at least we need to to be focused on our assets and have the capacity to do so. Um, and I'm, assu I'm assuming that uh, those um, amendments, Councillor, will accommodate that. Is, is, is everyone understanding that that's where we're wanting to land? Councillor Williams? I'm happy to answer that, but I mean, the words origin and purpose, I think are the avenue for the panel to request and for our staff to put up all of the background reports that there may have been over the last 30 years as to why schemes are as they are and are not something else. Um, if, if that needs to be written into the script of, of implementation, <coughs> fine. And, and again, you're right, it's, it's up to Mr Bayfield to, to finesse that. But I do think origin and purpose would be the home mm -hmm. uh, for that historical information content. Uh, Mr Bayfield, would you like to comment <coughs> any further on Councillor Curtin's suggestion? The suggestions, as I've picked them up from Councillor Curtin, that it is very definitely focused on what we can do better. Um, and I appreciate that. I imagine a number of other players in this business would appreciate that too. Um, telemetry and monitoring I've picked up from both Councillor Williams and Councillor Curtin. And the other one for me is, and I'm very interested in this, um, our investment so far, if you like, in risk assessment and, and what does the future offer? Um, because this isn't going to be the last one. So I've got that, and um, but I'm drawing heavily on the people sitting around me at the moment, Piri, Susie, and, and um, my Australian friend here, um, uh, Chris, 
in terms of I'm just coming to terms with this, although I do recognise that it is a remarkable resemblance to the um, Cullen inquiry on the on the river. So I congratulate you. It was a good one to flog. I flogged it as well on the Rangitaiki when we did the review down in, in Canterbury. So. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roadley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> good to hear that, um, Bill, and, and um, thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, yes, I do commend the, um, this independent review into our current assets. Um, and thank you for those additions to uh, 1.2, Councillor Williams, um, uh, respecting future possibilities. Um, Mr Bayfield, just um, wanting to be really confident and give some assurance to our communities that actually do not have a current scheme, uh, which is Wairua. Uh, we do have a, a small level of uh, drainage, uh, but we do not have flood protection. Uh, so, uh, circling back to the purpose and the audience, uh, I want all of the people in Wairua to, to have confidence that this review will explore the avenues beyond the existing uh, flood, flood protection that we provide. Uh, and so the people in Wairua know that the Regional Council are exploring what we could do better, what the level of risk is, and putting it into um, layman's terms that this review will tell us what happened and how we stop it happening again. Thank you, Councillor. I think if I can't give that assurance when we've landed this, then we will have failed. Mm -hmm. And I picked up from Chris that that was his exact point, that this shouldn't focus on the two big schemes alone that failed, but also the rest. Um, so I would imagine that there might be quite a few surprises turned up there. I Can guess I, I have the flag that the review, of course, must look at, at options for the future that might not be solely building stock banks higher, which as a nation a long way away from us has learned that experience. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I take um, heart from the, the uh, public opportunity to provide information, input and feedback, yes. and I'm hoping that that will cover not just existing, so that the wider community will have an opportunity to feed into this report, even though they don't have a current flood protection scheme. That's certainly the understanding I picked up from. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Harding. Kia ora, Chair. A couple of points to make. Firstly, on the um, time frames. Uh, two things there. One, the time taken to get to where we are, and also the time for for this independent review. On the question of the time taken to get here, it's been quite a journey, and it's been a journey involved that's been uh, initiated by us as councillors, and you know, and um, with a heroic job done by um, Councillor Williams um, to get us to this point, but also taking the time to consider and understand the views of staff and, and to mm. look at the practicalities mm. of, of, of achieving a review along with everything else that, that council as an organisation still needs to do, uh, uh, particularly with a strong focus on, on rebuilding stock banks before we get into winter. Um, but also that <coughs> we've had to take the time to understand where this sits in relation to other reviews. So it has taken a while. We're getting close now, um, but I, I think that time has been well invested. Question about when we get the outputs of that, I think we need we need a bit of bit more thought and 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 some advice from Mr. Bayfield on that. There's there's quite a juggling act to do. We know that we've in, involved in a a kind of a speed planning uh, exercise, of which the first stage of that we've put our regional resilience plan together to the regional recovery agency. We know that we have to do that again in, uh, by September, and <coughs> excuse me. Ideally, uh, we would have some output from a review by then, because that will then inform some quite big decisions. I don't know whether September is actually achievable, particularly when it comes to you know we we all recognise the importance of of community engagement and taking the time for that. So. It's quite a conundrum there in terms of in terms of the timing. So we and I think we need we probably it probably involves a bit of a two way discussion or three way in fact between Mr Bayfield staff and ourselves as councillors to to decide on whatever. And there's probably going to be a little bit of compromise in that or decisions about whether we compromise um, to work into other planning processes which are going to set the scene for our regional recovery. So there's that. 
just want to talk very briefly about the independent chair and, and just reflect that m merely by Councillor Williams, who's been um, one of the main drivers of the drafting of these terms of references and coming up with a fantastic suggestion of uh, Dr. Mitchell. Phil. Mitchell. Phil. I was thinking Philip. Um, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, nothing in that process gives me any cause for concern other than optics. And I trust... Uh, Mr. Bayfield to, and, and we've already made it clear mm. to Mr. Bayfield, I think, that if he has any concerns about that proposal, then he should feel completely comfortable to come back and say that that's not appropriate or have you thought about this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have utter confidence in, in what we are proposing. <coughs> and I'll also note that the rest of us as councillors haven't had any engagement with, with Dr. Mitchell at all over this. Um, final point I want to make is just from a drafting point of view, in terms of uh, drafting changes, you suggested, Councillor Williams, that there is a uh, point two of the exclusions further on, and that we have to yeah. take out. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Harding. Uh, Councillor Hukianga, kia ora. Madam Chair, if oh, I might yes. just respond to <coughs> so, my little experience in setting these up and running them. Um, I would also counsel you to take the advice of one other party in relooking if they request it at <coughs> your uh, scope um, and indeed the timeline, and that is to actually talk to the chair and the other panel members after they've had a, a, the job given to them. Mm. They, they often, it focuses the mind and they come back with very good advice as to how long it might take and what they might need. So I just put that as another, and while it might delay, I doubt whether it'll delay by much, but it could add much value rather than finding halfway through that the panel say, can we have another six weeks? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I, I, as a Māori Ward Councillor, I think it's important that I, I raise um, some of the prior discussions around the inclusion of uh, a mātauranga Māori expert or practitioner to be involved in this um, whole review process. Um, I just believe that it would provide a rich source of um, information and guidance, in particular around engaging with, um, with, with communities, not just Māori communities. Um, I guess the culturally mediated processes would, um, with the communities would, um, would benefit so greatly from the values that are embedded in Mātauranga Māori. Um, Notwithstanding, um, just uh, being informed directly through this process by those voices of the communities and how we sort of capture those voices and translate those voices into some uh, some real tangible, tangible outcomes and practical um, notions in front of us over the uh, period of the um, the recovery. Kilda, thank you, Councillor. Uh, would you like to comment on that, Bill? Uh, noted. No, noted. Absolute support. Kia ora. Thank you. Councillor Sears. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Very briefly, Chris, just checking Prongaho, like Wairoa, is in the, um, on the list of... So, so in places. terms of the, this review that yes. you're talking about, it is wide-ranging. It's whatever issue was raised with regards to flood control, um, drainage schemes, flood control schemes, anyone who would like to see a new scheme, that's the, the purpose to draw all of this out. Um, for sort of crowded position. Kia ora. Uh, Councillor McIntosh. Hey, yeah, Chair, just to, to uh, endorse Councillor Williams' point about the enormity of the event that we had, and with that, the fact that we were a hair's breadth away from having something a whole lot worse. And as far as the review is concerned of... Uh, absolute importance from a uh, perception and reality perspective is the independence of it, mm. in my view. And that includes uh, the people who are running that, that review and the actions we have in respect to it, as I say, both perception and reality. If we're going to get confidence out of it, the public's got to be absolutely confident about that. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor McIntosh. Um, Mike Paku. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Chris. Look, I'm basically just bringing us back to, to your paper, actually because you put up three options there. And from what I took from what you said uh, right at the start in regards to the flood protection plan for the Hedetonga and, and, and upper, upper Titok, I got the sense that, that there was 
there wasn't strong support for incorporating them both together, as you felt that uh, one, we need to take the wider the, the, the wider view, and at some stage the the review around the Heritage and Upper Upper Toki Tuk will happen, and it may it may even contribute to, or the other way around, the wider one may actually contribute to, allow some of the more more detail to take place later. So based upon that, that would be the direction you would be. I'm feeling that we're kind of suggesting, along with the added, mm. the added recommendations that have quite clearly been shown uh, by Councillor um, Williams in regards to the additional considerations that need to be added to it. Mm. Have I got that wrong? Are we able to move there? Yeah, if there are no further comments, Councillor Van, Van Beek? No? Councillor Foley? No. I think we are in the position too. So, um, Councillor oh, Williams, we'll let you lead the way. Yeah, well, thank you. If we just perhaps recap and go to the recommendations, it's one, one two, uh, five. There is a new six directs that any material changes to the review terms of reference or panel uh, con constitution be brought back to council for further resolution. Hopefully we've got that. There. Yes. Yeah, and then in the terms of reference, we'd added the reference to telemetry and stream monitoring uh, after drainage schemes in item one. And we'd added the reference to or any new or additional schemes after future events in item two. And as uh, Councillor Harding pointed out, we need to delete the second bullet point on page two as to those matters outside the scope of the review. And with all of that said, I move those recommendations, Chair. Thank you, and um, I'm happy to second those recommendations. Uh, would you like to speak any further? No, except just to fully endorse, and I apologise for admitting that I do think we definitely need my tauranga expertise on the panel and uh, what I would call a very specific hydrology uh, flooding uh, engineering uh, on the panel as well. Thank you. Kia ora. Any other comments? Councillor Curtin. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, <clears throat> given the um, uh, the extent of this review and its importance, um, I, I do think it's important to uh, to make some comment and to um, uh, acknowledge um, the communities that have stood up uh, in response to to the most significant threat to our communities for a very long time. Um, and it's um, it's important to do that and to provide uh, those communities and the people out there, uh, quite frankly, some heroic um, actions were taken and uh, we need to uh, uh, provide that opportunity, I think, as a part of this review, even though it's to the side, if you like, of the specifics, uh, we do need to, uh, to provide that opportunity and the voice for that. Um, the things that have concerned me most in this um, is um, the direction of travel that the organisation has had over its three three decade long uh, history since establishment, and um, I am somewhat um, um, humbled, embarrassed, if you like, having been the longest serving councillor around the, that those for, for about two decades, uh, that the risks and the vulnerability uh, that existed exists to our community. Uh, haven't been well identified. And I think from this perspective, uh, we're needing as a an organisation to face up to that and to recognise that um, we could have done better. Uh, we could have identified those risks. Uh, we could have mitigated those to some extent. It's not taking away from the event, which was a massive event, uh, unprecedented event, where you know as much as half a metre of rainfall within a very short space of time took place, the uh, impact on our infrastructure uh, was inevitably uh, um, catastrophic, as it proved to be. Having said that, I don't know whether we can afford to hide behind uh, the extent of the event uh, to over, to, if you like, to cover over some cracks in those vulnerabilities. Uh, by that I mean, uh, we ought to have been much more aware 
of the vulnerabilities to our telemetry and our flood warning systems. I think the review will get to the bottom of that and tell us what we need to do better to uh, mitigate vulnerability going forward. The other thing that strikes me is, in terms of risk assessing uh, our catchments, was the way in which our uh, lifelines were exposed and the fact that we were um, uh, isolated, the city of Napier completely isolated for such a long period of time, so many communities isolated for such a period, long period of time, uh, when we ought to have been working hard at, um, at, at, at increasing the resilience of our lifelines, our roading network, uh, our power network, our um, telecommunications network, uh, we now see having experienced long periods of um, uh, being off the radar, no, t no, no communications, no iPads to play with <laughs> for such a long period of time uh, that uh, how vulnerable we are. Uh, so they are things we're needing to focus in on. Uh, the other thing that, uh, Madam Chair, if you allow me a moment more and to comment on this, uh, because in the process of examining uh, and tweaking our review, uh, our, our review criteria and scope, it's inevitable that um, the public uh, will have concern uh, for our responsiveness in, uh, in an emergency. Quite frankly, we know every one of us around this table, uh, we didn't do so well and we need to do a lot better. Um, I know this review is not examining that, uh, but uh, in our discussions, we've recognised the need to, to coordinate, to collaborate and to ensure that the review that uh, uh, our chair will be uh, uh, facilitating along with her colleagues from the joint committee uh, is to ensure that it too achieves that level of independence and confidence from the public. The public will not recognise uh, to a great extent the difference between one review and the other, uh, though the, the, the many people that will want to have their say will choose one or the other, in fact, to have their say. So thus the need uh, to coordinate that, if, that, if, that, uh, that, that process. And I'm a little concerned and I hope, Madam Chair, we can convey back to our co-collaborators uh, uh, in terms of the CEDM Joint Committee uh, the need for openness and transparency uh, to have a wider scope than possibly has been tabled so far. And finally, Madam Chair, um, um, I just think we also need to contemplate from the Regional Council's perspective the civil defence responsiveness that we've, we've, we've got in front of us. Not all can be laid at the hands or the feet of the Joint Committee. This Council as well has got significant responsibilities as the lead player in civil defence. Uh, we need to contemplate the impacts it had on our organisation when all of our staff were taken away, swept aside along with the water uh, to somewhere else and asked to perform elsewhere, uh, leaving us somewhat um, adrift uh, internally. My own view, Madam Chair, is that uh, the structure we've set up regionally um, was never the right one. It goes back uh, nearly a decade in terms of its generation. There's no way that uh, the chair and four, counts, four mayors of the region uh, could take on that responsibility in terms of governing an entity uh, which requires a specific level of concentration, uh, a skill set that they don't have. Um, it needs a top to bottom review of structure and we need to, from this perspective, from our own council's perspective, come up with a structure and put <coughs> forward a, a much more robust, resilient civil defence response which is ground up as opposed to top down. And I think we have a task to do around this table in addition to any review both of our own infrastructure which is crucial to protecting communities, protecting life and livelihoods. We do need uh, to look at that response, responsiveness and do something radically different than what we've got currently. So, Madam Chair, 
thank you for the work done by staff, uh, by our colleagues around the table to get thus far with a review. Uh, I think we're on the right road. All I say is get on with it and get it done uh, at, at great speed because I know the next event is just around the next corner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Curtin, and, and thank you for clarifying uh, the two different reviews. Um, Councillor Foley. <coughs> uh, thank you, Chair, and, and uh, thank you to staff for presenting this paper in terms of reference at this time. As uh, Councillor Curtin said, um, very important piece of work, and um, yeah, the, the, probably the most important piece of work in my time as a councillor with the, with the benefit of hindsight now that we know um, what Mother Nature can throw at us. Um, like the rest of you, I've had a good opportunity now to talk to, um, to, to, to much of our community. And as we all know, they will be um, very interested in, in, this, in the, the outcome of this process, but also um, the, the, the opportunity to uh, participate and provide feedback because we've all heard and continue to hear the feedback of what um, where they see um, things could be improved or, or, or certainly be, be better next time. Um, so therefore, I very much endorse um, this process, um, look forward to the outcome myself. Um, just touch on probably the, the, the one disadvantage of this that we can't get around is the timing that this takes. So just last weekend, uh, there was heavy rain falling on, on, on large parts of Hawke's Bay. And um, just as um, our anxiety rose this morning, feeling the ground rolling beneath us, um, heavy rain on roofs right now gets everyone's anxiety up, and particularly those that uh, live in floodplains or next to stock banks or, or next to rivers in general. And so I, I guess in the meantime, as an organisation, we need to give our, our communities the confidence that um, we're continuing with you know, our core business, our, our business as usual, repairing the stock banks, the maintenance, the gravel extraction as much as we can um, because those people are saying um, you know, that they're kind of demanding it that um, you know, to see their, their lives and their property protected, they're, they're very anxious to see, see things done now. So, um, so, so with that, um, endorse the process and, um, yeah, look very much forward to the outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Van Bake. Yeah, um, first of all, um, um, my thanks goes out to Martin Williams, Councillor, Councillor uh, for doing an, an excellent job in setting this up. Um, and no doubt, uh, with uh, the help of Mr Bayfield, we'll arrive at a, at a point where we actually can be um, quite clear about what the, the findings are, but uh, findings are findings. It's what we do with them that is going to be really the, the key to it. Um, we may um, spend a lot of time in talking to the community uh, about what is required, uh, what the findings are, but what we follow through and how we follow through is actually going to be um, the, the proof in the eating. And that's, uh, I still want to remind you all to this day today when we are on, all in full vigour of, of putting a review in place, but then to follow it through and actually put it into place uh, so that we actually get a good outcome for our landowners and for the people, and especially for those families who've lost lives. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? No? Okay. Right of reply? Yeah, just uh, I just simply wanted to acknowledge also, uh, without straying into the civil defence side of things, that this organisation, our communities may not appreciate this, has done the work of a thousand people since February the 14th. Every staff member in this organisation, that means has done the work of three people, when in fact we needed 5,000. And that is part of the reality we're confronted by with climate change, in which I'm sure the National Review into Civil Defence will, will, will have to grapple with. So I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that enormous uh, effort done by our staff throughout, and it's just not even able to touch the sides of some of the big issues in front of us right now. With that, put the motions. 
Thank you all and thank you for your contribution. So all those who agree, say aye. Aye. Those against, <coughs> carried. Thank you very much. Um, we move on to our next item, which is the Chief Executive Appointments. And do we have Susie to run us through this? Thank you. I'm You're still up here. Uh, my name is on this paper. <laughs> yeah, I see this paper, uh, to be frank, is a mere formality. Uh, as we found out recently, we need uh, formal appointment and recognition through the minutes of Council of our appointments to CE. Uh, this helps us when we go to do funding transactions, etc., and need delegated authorities formally set. So, uh, mere formality. I'll take the paper as read. Uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you, Susie. Um, any questions or comments, Councillor Harding? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, just just a question on technicality. Um, we know from having met uh, properly. Uh, Mr Bayfield for the first time this morning that disaster follows him or he follows disaster, I'm not quite <laughs> sure which one that is and we've had a, a good shake up of an earthquake to, uh, to just underline that and I just noted when I was reading the paper that there's actually a, a timing gap between the mm -hmm. between the 5 o'clock in the, in the afternoon <laughs> on the 9th and the 8am on the morning of the 10th of which we are uncovered for the purposes of this of this um, <laughs> Piece, this instrument, and I just wanted to question whether that was important or not. It is. Susie, it is important. A gap's is. important. <coughs> so you will need to go to 9 a.m. on that Monday. I'll, I'll be it till 9 a.m., okay? Thank you. Thank you. So if we could have that change, Leanne, in the recommendations to... 9 a.m. 10 to 9, nine item 2. Oh. Well, that would, that would create a one-hour overlap, which is probably unnecessary. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't, so we can let you off at 8 o'clock. Thanks. Thanks so much. <laughs> yep. Yep. Should we turn that and sure we get uh, closed? Not that time here. <laughs> Thank you for picking that up, Councillor Harding. Any other questions or comments for this item? Just, just happy, to, happy to second with the um, amendment if you've moved it, Councillor Harding. Yep. Happy to second. <coughs> Thank you. We'll put that on the table. All those who agree, say aye. 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 Those against, carried. Thank you very much. Uh, we are moving on to our um, report from, and recommendations from CNS Committee. Who are we inviting up here? Uh, okay. <coughs> you, Who would like to me? lead this one? I'm, I'm happy to talk to that if Neil wants to, at the end, mop up anything. Just chair of that committee. Uh, so this paper is a summary of the Corporate and Strategic Committee. We met uh, for the first uh, time. Uh, on the 5th of April. Now, interestingly, the Corporate and Strategic Committee is one that receives the Treasury report and the financial report. Uh, so, uh, more recently, off the back of the cyclone, uh, this council has seen quite a large number of financial information reports. Uh, what we saw at the CNS come through was uh, figures, uh, rightly so, is at the 31st of December, being the review period. However, uh, those figures were... Uh, uh, and had been discussed at length, including new ones through the cyclone. So uh, just noting that uh, the discussion at the meeting was for the December period, although noting that most of the council have seen numbers up to the March post-cyclone more recently. There was nothing uh, that the committee uh, confirmed the terms of reference uh, for the Corporate and Strategic Committee, uh, noting a few additions uh, in point 2.1 to 2.3. The quarterly Treasury report, uh, as we discussed at the time, had no compliance uh, or any issues coming through that uh, outside of um, uh, noting that our managed funds uh, continued to uh, produce lower than expected returns through that portfolio. That was very similar to the prior quarter uh, and something that the Council are well aware of. Um, I'll take the rest of the paper as read, uh, but it was possibly the shortest uh, committee uh, that we'd had in quite some time. Uh, if you want to add anything, Neil. Oh, it's just great chairmanship, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just um, comment, um, um, councillors, that um, the terms of reference are included uh, for your reference mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in, attached to the paper. 
Um, uh, but I would I would comment on them that uh, given the current situation and the relationship with the recovery committee, uh, the newly stood up recovery committee, is inevitable uh, that our financial scenarios, planning, etc., uh, will be extremely interlinked with that committee. So. I'm um, confident that we can just simply cut and paste, uh, depending on the urgency of any matter, uh, to go from one committee to the other to get business transacted as quickly as we can. I would comment further on uh, 1.1 and 1.2 of the terms of reference that uh, we have an extremely cluttered um, uh, two-month period between May uh, and June to get um, a recrafted strategic plan uh, put on put in place, uh, which is matched with an annual plan process leading into the long term plan. Uh, so um, I think we'll be distributing a, um, if you like, a key milestones uh, for the next two months. Is that ready to roll, uh, Susie? That that um, I think um, Desiree and Kay, yes. oh, Sarah's uh, got okay. that. Yeah. Are we ready to roll with that? Yeah. Uh, so that will um, that will come your way shortly, and all that I've asked that, given uh, the extent of, of work we need to do and timing uh, that you've got in front of you, a uh, bit of a quick go-to point to say, "Gosh, that's due then," etc. So you've got a sequence going forward for that. Um, uh, those reports, Madam Chair, um, uh, go to the 31st of December. All bets are off. Anything you saw in those reports, forget it. Uh, we've got a whole new ball game in front of us, so the next six months will be um, six months reports will be fascinating from that perspective. Uh, but uh, thank you for the staff for uh, their due diligence or diligence in in, um, in in getting this information in front of us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, questions or comments? If there are none, would you like to move? The recommendation to receive the uh, reports, Madam Chair. And Councillor Harding, second. Would you like to speak? No. Oh, sorry, I, just, I should have confirmed it's also um, uh, an action item to adopt the terms of reference. So it's not only receiving reports, but it's adopting so adopt the terms of reference. It. Yes, thank you. Included. You're happy with that? And you'd like to speak? Thank yes, you, Councillor. Just, just very briefly, I just wanted to note, and this is um, an issue that I brought up at the Corporate Strategic uh, Committee meeting, that the accounts that we're looking at, so the, the, the now very historic six monthly accounts to, to December, uh, we're going to put a complete set of accounts. So we're still working in this uh, sort of interregnum between <coughs> the systems and, and we acknowledge that that's a risk and that's less than optimal practice, but uh, it's, a, it's a known risk and uh, I certainly will be keeping an eye on that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's fully accepted that uh, staff are doing the best with the conditions and the state of the, the transfer to our new accounting system that, that can be achieved in the time. Thank you, Thank you for noting that. Any other comments? We are none. All those who agree, say aye. 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 Those against, carried. Thank you very much. Uh, fixing the common seal, I'm happy to move. Councillor Foley, you happy to second? Yep. There are no comments. All those who agree, say aye. Aye. Those against, carried. Um, we enter our information and performance monitoring items. So we've got strategic projects report uh, for February to March. Who would like to lead us on this item? Sarah? Yeah, come up the front, Sarah. <coughs> Bring uh, your order. hands. <laughs> Kilda. Um, this is, um, this is a, um, I picked this up from um, our project manager who's moved on to the recovery team. So this is my first month doing this. Um, I'll take the paper as read. Um, probably the GMs will be the best people to comment on the individual strategic projects, but I've slightly changed um, how it's presented so you can track, see a sort of a, how it's tracked um, for the previous six months as well, um, to just to show you um, um, whether uh, red flags are really um, so hopefully that um, the format is has improved it a little bit thank you so much uh, questions councillor says thank you through you chair and um, probably a question um, uh, for you Ian uh, in terms of environmental um, damage and work and our all our environmental programs I know there's um, been a number of comments in the community around a lot of um, work that's been washed away or run off hills and 
and some concern that a lot of the work we've done hasn't been valid, really. Um, and I'm putting it there because um, through our own travels um, up to Waitara, we've seen you know huge success some of the work we've done, and I'd, I'd really like to hear from you in relationship to this report, um, what you're seeing, um, what's been working, and how we're working forward with programs that we know are, are successful and, and um, well, giving us buffers against this event, these sorts of events. <coughs> Excuse me, yes, um, through you, Chair. Look, it's a, it's a conversation that we're aware is being held in numerous quarters. Um, particularly when people are standing beside <coughs> areas of their farm they might have invested in that's now under silt or has been washed away. I guess probably three points. One would be that um, we would acknowledge that uh, for some of our programs uh, and the investments, the work, the, the, I guess the maturity of those <coughs> um, plantings and the likes were just not ever going to endure what Mother Nature threw at them. They were just too young. Um, so that's disappointing, obviously, but not surprising. Um, so it's not un not unexpected to have seen some of the damage and losses that we've seen given the scale and maturity of the plantings. That's point number one. Point number two would be that that's a specific line of inquiry that we've got in our revised science program to understand um, if you like, the mechanics of failure for um, our land. Uh, what happened, why did it happen, how did it happen, um, land classes, vegetation types, et cetera, et cetera. So we can start to, as we get to the stage where we want to look at um, future investments, we can look broadly at the facts about what we know, uh, what, what happened and what didn't happen. And so we can think then about our investments going forward and how we might do our work. And I guess the last point would be, is, is kind of a saying that I'm starting to run with my staff, is not to lose the faith. I'm sure that the people who were instrumental in, um, and had the foresight in some of our strategic soil conservation programs like Tanguyo Soil Conservation Reserve, um, if they're alive today, we'll be looking at that and going, what a fantastic um, solution that was for the land in terms of holding it together. And it's they're able to do that because it's been in place a long time and it's mature and it's established. So I think we just need to, in time, figure out from a very um, analytical perspective, from an evidence basis, what worked and what didn't, to then re-gear our programs to more effectively target the work that we know is effective and worked well uh, in this event and just to not lose the faith that because stuff ended up in the bottom of the gully that was only three years old, um, well unfortunately that was always probably going to happen because it just wasn't wasn't able to cope with what threw it at. But longer term, that's still going to be a viable solution. Yeah. Just to follow up on that? Yeah, sure. So thank you, Ian, because I've seen some fantastic successes um, in, as you say, more established plantings, but what, what you're talking about and some of the investment we're seeing um, in, in Ford papers is going to be around actually quantifying that so we, we have quite clear data on, not just anecdotal, but quite clear data on, on those successes and looking at accelerating those types of work. Is that the intention? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McIntosh. Um, yes, under uh, Regional Water Security, page 23, um, I'm wondering why is the red flag on that, given that the advice we have by the Regional Water Assessment <coughs> Program is that what we've just experienced in the context of a flood, the severity of that is likely to be replicated in the context of a drought. And so have I interpreted that cor correctly, that the, the components of, which is managed aquifer recharge and heritanga water storage, uh, those regarded as high risk activities, as in high risk of not receding. I think the look the, the reason we've highlighted it as a red is there's further delay in bringing the, the regional water assessment to you. It was it was due to occur, and it's now happening uh, in a, in a month or so. Um, we've also seen significant cost escalation uh, in in the construction sector. So projects like the manager aquifer recharge, we're going to have to 
Uh, now that we're through that consenting gateway or almost through the consenting gateway, there's going to be some risks around that. So they've grown slightly um, from previous reporting periods, but certainly both projects are very important. They are the, the other side of the coin in relation to flood control. It's being resilient during a drought, <coughs> and that's certainly um, how we see commu um, communication going forward. On one hand, we have flood control. On the other hand, we have... Um, uh, efficient and good use of water. So is the red flag primarily related to timing and cost? Yep. Thank you, Councillor. Oh, you. Councillor Williams. Thank, thank you. you. I just had a question around my favourite topic, <laughs> um, apart from reviews, obviously, is land for life. Um, everyone knows I see as an absolute cornerstone recovery and resilience project. Uh, <clears throat> now, the word reposition is used in 1.1. Ian, this might be one for you. Um, cheers. So the question is, uh, been working closely with the catchment team to reposition the project uh, to be a key you know, tool to support. What, what, what sort of, can you just paint a picture of some of the repositioning that's contemplated there that they might embrace that didn't previously? Sure. Um, look, it's really effectively just massively scaling, accelerating the program up. Um, so you're aware that we had a program for 15 pilot farms, which are pretty much complete now, and digital farm plans being produced for those. We're talking about um, scaling it up to two to 400 farms, um, and doing that as quickly as we can. So we're working through what that would look like, how it would work, what would we would need to do to achieve that, working closely with MPI um, to... Uh, understand that, recognising that this kind of starting proposition is that we wouldn't be looking to <clears throat> have council necessarily be an investor in those farms, but we'd see private capital and impact investing um, filling the investment gap. It's just what, from a extension, farm planning, resourcing kind of perspective we'd need to have to deliver that. Also, just, I guess, starting to use the language now in the rural recovery space that Land for Life is a critical tool mm. for those farmers who want to take a fundamental look at their property end to end as a result of this, Land for Life is a key tool. Chair, the, the question that follows from that, I just um, ask this of any of the staff or to leave it ringing in their ears, we have made various bids to central government for money. Um, has this project been part of, for our recovery, you know, uh, flood protection schemes, new ones for Idaho, that sort of thing. Um, has this uh, been part of any budget request or is the thinking that it doesn't need to be because it's going to largely be private sector funding other than our uh, administration or enabling role? Um, so it, it hasn't gone into a, a budget bid in terms of, like I say, investment on farm, but it's mm -hmm. part of the overall rural, reco rural recovery package that Richard Wakeland has worked on that we would effectively need more catchment advisors, farm planners, right. et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question um, probably best answered by you, Kerry. Um, could you give us an update on the Kotahi plan and what the thinking is there? And then possibly if I could ask you, Mike, um, the sort of sentiment and capacity around taking Kotahi plan forward as, as chair of the, Marae, uh, the, the Māori committee. So Kerry, just over to you first for an update. Um, yes, so apologies. So the 5.1 is a little light on the detail, but um, as it indicates there, um, all of my team were deployed into civil defence functions for quite some time. Um, so the work was paused initially in any case. Um, but what we've essentially stepped into now is a situation where, as you all know, as all governors, the next step, the next phase of Kotahi was for us to go to place and have you know those really rich conversations, particularly around the visions and values. Um, and... It's, it's really difficult for us in terms of logistics to be having um, conversations in Wairua, you know, over Zoom and things like that. And also, um, you know, we're hearing very loud and clear that Marae um, and our iwi and hapu are just not in this space right now to have those conversations. Uh, it's not to say that we are putting all of the work on ice. Um, it's just to say that we ca we're not ready right now to do that. It's not... Um, 
practical mm. or feasible, really, um, and certainly not at all sensitive to be having those conversations around um, freshwater planning because, as we all know, our freshwater has been severely impacted as a consequence of the cyclone. Um, I'd say in addition to that, though, um, we are having conversations with the Ministry around whether we might be able to um, find solutions around our timeframes because, as you all know, we were expected to notify our plan by December 24. Um, and again, we've, we've highlighted to the Ministry that it's really just not fair on our community to be having these conversations around developing policy. That's not to say we don't have our eye on the prize in terms of you know trying to look after our fresh water, but um, particularly our science, um, we are having to relook at all of our waterways to understand what is what is the current baseline now of our waterways. Um, we, we don't know what that looks like. Um, so when we were thinking about attributes and targets and limits uh, six months ago, that could be quite dramatically changed now. So. Um, I think it's really just a matter of pausing for the moment um, and letting everybody catch their breath and then look to reframe this um, a bit further down the track. Kerry, Mike, Kia ora. Yeah, Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have to agree with Kerry. I think it was going to be a challenging conversation to start with. Mm. Mm. Um, given everything else that's taken place, especially in regards to the, the cyclone, not forgetting we've still got tanks sitting in the background, mm. and then we've got the three waters conversations to take place. Now, there's a whole swirl of consultation that needs to take place. I, I, I'm terrified that it's just going to turn into one big disjointed conversation if, 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 if we're not careful of, of um, finally having to, if you like, unpack all those <coughs> various conversations. Mm. I, I'm still not quite too sure whether there's a general understanding of what Kotahi is out there, and especially within our Māori communities. So I don't know if we've done enough mm. in regards to that um, publicising and that notification of just what that conversation is. Um, so, yeah, I, I actually agree, mm. given where everyone is, especially with regards to the cyclone, the, the reviews that are about to take place, mm. uh, and mana whenua's is going to want to want to be part of those reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, so you start to add all those layers to that conversation and becomes a very complex such complex environment very, very quickly. Mm. So absolutely. yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Foley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gravel. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, notwithstanding by security rules demand <coughs> level of service, the, the stretches of rivers alongside uh, Waipakaro, Waipawa, is there any reason why, if the surveys are done and we consider them still still at a one in 100, why we couldn't just you know keep extracting to provide better um, resilience, particularly in that area, those areas? So, so it's around the requirements of the scheme. So the consent for gravel extraction requires us to work against the grade line developed for the scheme. So in terms of going beyond the grade line, that's not something we can do under our consent. And it's about delivering on that level of service. So there's different ways to increase the level of service, but under our gravel extraction consent, we, we're not permitted to go beyond the requirements of the scheme. So that's part of part of the answer to that, I think, in terms of because you're talking about going below grade and effectively deepening and widening the the channel. I guess I'm talking about you know a perceived <coughs> continued build up yep. in an area where so people you know see every day yeah. go over bridges. So in terms of our, our management, we on a three yearly cycle survey uh, all of our schemes in terms of the the gravel deposition and then we target those areas obviously for extraction where it's needed to be extracted so there is quite a robust process uh, behind those decision making and there's an annual report um, which summarises the survey results against the requirements of the schemes which then guides uh, staff in terms of their authorisations for gravel extraction so that's that's what we aim to do and then obviously the overlay on that is the economics and the demand and then 
uh, initiatives such as the IRG uh, Crown Initiative, where we where we fund extractors to to go to certain places. So, I guess we work, work that that's the rationale I think for working through the locations. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm saying put put the rationale aside though. Like, would would extracting more, or you know, um, perception is there's no extraction happening, but Outside those two town centres, would that provide better protection from flooding? Well, I think it depends. Is the is the answer? So, with any river, you, you it, it's it is quite a danger to look at one section in isolation because whatever you do will have impacts upstream and downstream potentially. So, we try and manage the river as a whole, uh, which is why we go to great deal to work out where the problems are and prioritise those issues rather than just pick a certain location. And I guess what will come out of our, our, our new review of the Upper Tuki Tuki scheme is are there improvements that can be made and that will be in consideration of the entire scheme. Uh, and again, an ability to prioritise uh, and fund those improvements on a, on a, with a holistic scheme view. Yeah, I was wondering if I could ask a follow-up question to that. Dr Williams, yep. Yeah. So, someone looking at off the uh, bridge at Waipawa, Waipukuro at the moment, seeing gravel, would they be looking at gravel that is, to your knowledge, uh, at the grade line or above the grade line, or do we not know yet when was the last survey, I guess is my question. So, for that location, I'd have to um, ask for that information from staff. But a lot of our, um, a lot of the challenge with the survey is to do it properly. We also need to understand what's happening at, under the wetted surface, uh, right. and that provides some challenges at the moment. Yeah. So when river levels are high, it's challenging for us to do those surveys. But we are doing uh, some temporary surveys to understand right. what can easily be seen uh, in relation to extracting gravel. So we're not waiting for the perfect solution. Yeah. Uh, in certain locations, we're actually working with contractors to identify uh, where there is obvious material so we can get things um, working. When would the last survey at Waipawa have been? Oh, again, it's on a three-year revolving yeah, so just... sort of thing across our entire network, so we can we can get that information. I'll make a note. That's interesting. I'm just wondering, because in Bowler there was a lot of talk about gravel moving. Yep. And I guess part of my question is, do we know yet, or the survey's yet to be done, I think you've answered it, as to whether this event moved gravel to the sea or not? So so it would have. We haven't got a comprehensive answer to that question, but I've certainly seen locations, uh, particularly in the Tuki Tuki, where there's now a metre and a half of gravel where there never used to be. Right. And that's right up in the ranges. Um, so there's been certain massive volumes moving around. That's great. That's what having. Yeah, just, just a small observation to, to chip into that. I had the benefit of... Uh, going up the Esk Valley uh, a week or so, probably 10 days or so ago, with staff and um, Minister Verrill. Mm -hmm. And one of the discussions I had with one of the, uh, let's say it was Niwa staff member, I can't recall, which it might have been it, someone from uh, uh, Canterbury you, University. But it, it, anyway, um, so bathymetry, so what they are looking at. So so the capacity might not be within us, but there is actually now technology available, which I understand is actually being deployed to look at that wetted area. So I think we're, we're in the space that it shouldn't be too far away that we actually get to look underneath mm. the watery bits in our streams. And they are, you know, so I took confidence from that, that day that we've got scientists that are on that and, and um, have the technology now to look through the rivers and do that maths pretty quickly. Mm. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Van Peck. Yeah, um, definitely just a word to you, Chris. The community is absolutely about gravel. You know, wherever you go, they just, and it's so that you see gravel levels and you, you see it appearing uh, and they straight away draw conclusions. And until we start measuring, I think after this event, I think we need to put some emphasis in. Anyway, that's just a comment, so comment. Um, um, Mr. Bayfield actually made it clear that in four years' time we're going to have a drought. He predicted it, so <laughs> I said it here first. Um, so I'm, act, I'm actually looking at our next disaster, which is <laughs> uh, which is a drought. So a regional water security program. Um, 
uh, two questions, and it's a, it's a good question that you had, um, Councillor McIntosh, in regards to the uh, the red diamond. I didn't know how you actually uh, have a red diamond uh, identify a risk, but it was well explained. So thank you very much for that. Uh, two questions: um, Who's the lead on this project right now? Um, so, so we're currently working through a transition. Okay. Uh, so the plan is to transition those infrastructure projects into the infrastructure team. That's held up by uh, headed up by John Kingsford. Okay. And then ultimately we'll restructure how that team looks. So he's got the right um, structure and resources within that team to deliver on, on all of the infrastructure projects we have. Yeah. And I just need to find out what kind of coffee he drinks. Next, um, the, in the design um, that we're looking forward, is there a spill capacity? For instance, have we thought of um, holding water and spilling water? to use in events, not possibly as big as this, it wouldn't make any difference, but in future events. Has that been part of the thinking? We haven't discussed it as of yet. Yeah, so there is, a, there is a spillway and it will have a capacity. I guess one of the questions is what capacity should it have? And that's something uh, that we'll look at through the next um, phase. I know uh, as part of Tom's outgoing discussion, we're talking about things like that. So there's still opportunity to fine tune okay. and work through all those. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, none. Um, if we can have a mover and a seconder to receive uh, the report, thank I'll you. Move. And Councillor says thank you. All those who agree, say aye. Aye. All those against, carried. Thank you. Significant organisational activities through to May. Who would like to lead out on this one? It's pretty much the same thing, isn't it? It's quite similar, yep. Take it as red chair and answer a question. Yep. Fantastic. Any questions on this item? Uh, Councillor Curran. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it be no surprise, Chris, on this question. Uh, can I take you to um, Asset Management Group? Um, I just want to, you've categorised, or has been categorised in the report, uh, Napier Urban Waterways uh, going down to Napier Miani NCC MOU yep. and Napier Miani Scheme Review. Yep. Um, it was my impression that the uh, MOU would fall out of the scheme review. Is that a separate exercise? Yeah, so there's two separate pieces of work. The, the MOU is how we work with Napier City Council on this cross-ownership arrangement. Um, and so that's due to come back to both councils for consideration in terms of an amendment to how the scheme is operated and whether certain assets should be owned by one organisation or the other. So that's one piece of work. The Napier Scheme Review is, is reviewing the scheme with a focus on the open waterways uh, so Napier's review that they did a couple of years ago now very much focused on the piped network. This one focuses on the open waterway network and we were due to bring a workshop uh, during just after the cyclone so we need to reschedule that. I think there's a typo in here, it says the 19th of April but that's obviously been and gone. So uh, we're due to bring back some of the preliminary findings of that work and they'll ultimately work themselves into our LTP. And just to follow on, um, Madam Chair, uh, in terms of your review of the schemes um, generally, uh, cyclone-related response, uh, have you got or is there a preliminary position on the performance of the pump network, uh, both for Napier Urban Waterways plus those associated or within the Napier City boundaries? So, um, sort of just going off the cuff, so we haven't done a specific review of that network in relation to the um, cyclone. Uh, we did have issues in Taradale uh, in terms of the ca capacity within the typo to remove um, stormwater. Um, but my recollection of the large pump systems is they generally worked okay. Um, but And obviously part of the discussion we'll have with the consultants around the analysis because we have asked to understand the impact of climate change uh, on those schemes is whether the latest event actually alters the um, you know the record that we would determine level of service on so that's just to confirm do you see that pump performance as a part of your of your general cyclone post cyclone asset reviews so I guess there's two layers. So, so one will be the general review of, of all schemes or no schemes, um, flood control and drainage. So obviously there might be some recommendations uh, come out of that work. In terms of our focus on the flood control schemes, I think we can't do everything all at once. 
And so our priority is to look at the Hiratonga Flood Control Scheme and the Upper Tukituki Flood Control Scheme, providing that high-level protection to big events. All of the pump networks provide a, a much lower level of service, apart from obviously in the Napier urban area. And when we bring the recommendations from the review on Napier Urban, you'll see that there's significant investment uh, required potentially uh, to really future-proof the city. Uh, Council McIntosh. A, a gravel extraction mark two. I think this is a question for you, Ian. The, um, can you tell me what the status is, please, on the uh, lower and upper Toki Toki, especially in respect of farmers being able to extract gravel? So the, um, the controlled area notice is still in play. So there's still a provision for landowners uh, connected to the catchment in those areas that have previously been unable to access gravel directly out of the out of the uh, tuki tuki to get it for their on-farm use for recovery. So that's that's still operative now. Okay, so there's a there's a place in our website for that. Um, they can find the biosecurity team here. Um, and there's a, a very simple process to go through to get access to it. Okay. Yeah. So that, that incorporates the lower toki toki too. Correct. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roadley. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ian, hmm. uh, item 5960, the Rural Impact Assessment Survey. Can you give us a bit of detail around what that might look like and how that might uh, work? So it's, <clears throat> that survey is underway at the moment. Um, last check, uh, we had 300 responses, and I'm, it's hopefully a lot higher than that today. And look, it's effectively a, a survey that we've conducted um, to gain a good understanding of the on-farm impacts um, of the event. There's a number of surveys have been conducted or rolled out in varying ways and various sort of um, approaches. We've, we've stepped back and taken a more kind of comprehensive survey approach that's quite broad ranging in its nature. Um, it's, it's going to then um, run through a bit of a check to see whether we've covered the region adequately. So we want good coverage of the whole region. If not, we'll follow it up. Uh, and then importantly, it's got the provision for us to kind of, or, or uh, an ability for landowners to ask for help and for us to to go back and, um, if you like, have a callback service and um, have somebody make contact with them and understand what their specific needs are. But it really is going to help us frame up our rural recovery strategy that Richard Wakeland is working on at the moment, start to quantify some of the impacts and the areas that are um, most important to landowners and help guide what our, our work program is going to need to look like in the short to medium term to respond to that. And so what I'm hearing is that the survey is a piece of that information gathering or it is the sole capture of information? No, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the sole determinant of what we would invest in, but it's certainly a big part of it. Yeah. Because we farmers, we hate those surveys. No, no, we've tried, <laughs> look, we've tried to incentivise it. We're acutely aware that this isn't a, you know, it's not a um, telemarketing kind of survey. Um, what we're trying to appeal to the farming sector is that this is the evidence base, if you like, which will allow us to both uh, advocate on their behalf to central government, but also create a program of work that's going to suit or meet their requirements. So we, we get that nobody likes a survey, that the, the um, survey specialist that we've engaged is a particularly experienced rural practitioner, so he gets that and he understands rural communities. Um, and we're, we're using our networks of known people who we think can really add value to that survey process to, to help get the information into it. Thank you. Councillor Harding. Sure, oh, Chair. Um, I think this is a question, well, I know this is a question for Ian. Uh, um, Ian, you touched on it in, uh, in earlier comments around recovery and, and staffing requirements. Under post-cyclone rural recovery workshops, uh, 61 through 63, talk about um, MPI on-farm support team and a collaborative and coordinated recovery extension program. My question is, or well, twofold, one is let's have a bit more insight into this on-farm support team that MPI have come up with and, and 
the other thing, well, knowing that this is a contested space or a complicated space around all the on-farm support and advisory around catchment communities, individual farmers, and this dovetails into the whole freshwater farm planning uh, national uh, regime. So in all that, I'm, my interest is to understand at what time we, we can expect clarity over the rollout of the freshwater farm plan regime, is it in, in whatever guise that might be nationally but also tweaked locally, how that feeds into what MPI are doing on the ground or trying what capacity they're trying to build or have built versus our uh, independent contractor, the, the potential future farm plan riders and our own catchment <coughs> delivery <coughs> team uh, and our our, our uh, uh, the staff dealing in the, in the space of uh, supporting catchment groups. So there's quite a lot. Of, it's a busy space. We've been, been constantly in this process of waiting for bits to land. It has, we how it lands and where it lands, there's some big decisions in how we staff that catchment delivery part of thing, you know, things and how that dovetails in to land for life, for example. So when are we going to understand that mix? Yes, yeah, quite a lot in there. Um, first, first, <laughs> yeah. look, OEPs. Taking notes. I've yeah. got two pages. Well, 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 miss anything? <laughs> please, please ask. Um, on farm support OEPs. Yep. It's Tony Goodlass. Um, I guess let's start with the MPI piece. So we've gone into this with a partnership approach with MPI, and I'm holding the pen on a partnership agreement with them at the moment to effectively align and coordinate central and local government to exactly the same way we've done freshwater implementation using a model we've got with MFE, thinking about how we can do that for rural recovery. So that's, if you like, um, um, got strong support and agreement and principle from MPI leadership for that approach. We've just got to tidy up those loose ends. And that goes to the coordination around uh, uh, catchment groups, et cetera, et cetera, because they get that we're in that space, they are as well, so we don't want to bump into each other, right? So we're working on that piece to make sure that doesn't happen. Farm plans, we don't know yet what um, what uh, uh, the final position is. We've asked to go right at the back of the queue for the implementation phase of the uh, farm plan regs. We're going to bring advice to you shortly on how to align the tuki tuki planning process with that so that the two become one. And we're effectively saying that we'll be doing some audit tidy ups at the moment. We won't be asking farmers in May next year to resubmit a farm plan. We'll make sure the ones they've got now are audited and we'll, we'll then have those come into the 2025 farm plan regs down the track. But we've got to bring you that advice yet because we haven't got certainty on agreement on those timeframes with MFE, but that's something we're working on. Um, and then I guess what we need from a catchments Implement or catchment advisor, catchment operations space, will be largely informed by the work Richard's doing on the rural recovery strategy, which is what's the big picture direction, who needs what where, what time frames, leading into the implementation plan, which you'll write as well, which is how do we operationalise that, what sort of resources, when do they drop in. What I am saying to anyone who will listen is that this is absolutely a marathon for us, not a sprint, and so we're in this for the long haul, and we don't want to rush into doing anything now that might give us the wrong outcomes later that we hadn't foreseen. So we're we're trying to keep everything moving at a sort of good good pace and providing support where it's needed, get the alignment and coordination with ourselves and central government, and then very soon, certainly. Um, Hopefully before the end of this financial year, you'll have visibility of the strategy and an indication of what the implementation pathway is going to look like. So if we need to build more resourcing into it, it's either coming from our recovery um, bid or it comes into the long-term plan. Thanks, Ian. Well, I can't overemphasise how central this is to actually getting uh, resilience you know, and, and in the you know, farm, farming, the pastoral sector and and keeping soil ultimately in its place. So, and there's just such a lot of moving parts at the moment. But and until a lot of the land, I don't, Ian can't make sensible decisions about how all the organisation about what our field staff do and how many you know, how many we should have that sort of thing. But it's just so critical. Thank you, Councillor uh, Mike. Uh, returning back to gravel. Sorry. 
Uh, question 14, paragraph 14 in there. So just in regards to the Tonga Whenua monitoring. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure who is best to answer this question, but in regards to, is Regional Council happy in the preparation, the preparations around making sure Mana Whenua are ready for that engagement? So I can ask the team that specifically. Look, look, they have been scheduled, um, and obviously if, if, if that's not a good time, we're, we're happy oh, no, to no, hear no, that. No, no. Yeah. I think, it, I think it really is just, this has been a long conversation yes. over a number of years. Yeah. So we finally got here. Yeah. Um, from regional council's perspective, has, has Mana Whenua got itself into the right frame of mind to actually be able to pick this up and, and go forward with it? That's basically what I'm asking here. So I'll probably need to check in on the team on that, um, around the specifics and timing. Yeah. But, um, yeah, my understanding is that it was going well, but I haven't spoken to that team for a few weeks now, so um, I can do that and get back yep. to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Will. Oh, just before I get to my questions, um, Ian, just to be clear about Jock's question around the lower toki, it's just to that location on the downstream side of the Patongata Bridge, so it doesn't go down any further than that. So is that clear? Sure. Yeah, so sorry if it was if that wasn't clear. <clears throat> those who are downstream in the catchment can get access to gravel from I think we've gone a K and a half below Patongata Bridge. Um, so there's a place for them to source gravel, not necessarily directly from there. Um, oh, okay. No, no, that wasn't clear. So that, that, right. um, it's most unlikely they're going to do that, is it? Because it's uh, we've had requests for that. That's why we shifted the boundary down to allow those who couldn't cross the Patongata Bridge. Um, to come in from the true right and take it downstream. Yes, I'm sort of thinking of people near the Red Bridge. Uh, that they're, It's going to be very expensive, I think, to travel up to Patongata and get it and bring it back. Yeah, and, and look, in terms of the, the notice, we've responded to feedback from people to say, look, actually, this is something that would make our life easier if you provided a, a change to the... Uh, the, the the form and shape of the notice. So if the <coughs> feedback is that there are a, a, a large number of landowners at the bottom end of the catchment who need access to material as well who haven't got it, then we can adjust the notice. Okay. So we'd, we'd originally designed it for the feedback that we'd got around that sort of Potonga to upstream section rather than necessarily thinking there was an issue downstream. So the people that are chatting to me, I should get them to chat to you. I think the lower is not <laughs> within the CNG area. And so previously there there was uh, there wasn't a lot of gravel, and in fact we had stopped extraction in that lower Tuki Tuki area. So that may be one of the issues. Yeah. So if people want to extract gravel out of the rivers, they should contact our team, which is Astra, and and she looks after all of those authorisations. Um, otherwise, take you can take it offline. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, no, I didn't get on. To, no, I didn't get onto my questions. Um, oh. Carry on. No, no, sorry, he wasn't finished. Yep. <laughs> uh, seven, the macro scheme. Um, I see a point there. Um, great to see work going on. Now we're well behind in our AGM there, so is, is there a def definitive date that we've got? Oh, look, I'll have to follow up with Ant, whether there's a, whether there's a definitive date for the, the um, annual general meeting. Uh, so I'm happy to do that and get, get that. Yeah, they're pretty passionate scheme members out there, so I appreciate that. Um, Points eight and nine, stop bank repairs. Um, can you put some thought into um, recreational users of our stop banks that are causing grief, basically, and and um, community members that you know now feel convinced that it's you know it's it's um, causing wear and tear and weakening our stop banks, and to how we might manage that. <coughs> So we can certainly take that on. Uh, certainly these reviews will be an opportunity. The other thing to note is most of our stock banks have at least a 600 mil freeboard. So they're 600 mil higher than they need to be. So, you know, if there was any, and all the, you know, the ground's constantly moving. Um, and so there is, you know, there is that freeboard uh, for, for most of our stock banks. In our newer ones, it's up to a metre. So, um, so that's something to take into consideration as well. But certainly... Uh, the recreational use of our areas around the rivers, we're, we're happy to have a look at. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. It's actually on the same topic, um, and it may be just me. It's number 22, and it's for you, Chris, yep. regarding the re a rapid rebuild, and we get a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, I was taught four languages, and I don't speak any of them very well, as you can hear, but uh, my reading is even worse. Um, the way that reads is that in the next two to three weeks, uh, we'll have all the major breaches repaired. But that's, that can't be right, correct? Which which one are you reading? Number 22. 22. Asset Management Group. 14 so, have been permanent. Uh, in the in construction phase. Okay, and we've we've got how many pods going in construction phase? So we had thirteen at last count. I'll just have a look here, and it gets tricky because some the numbers sort of move around because we have locations of breaches. Yeah. Then we have multiple breaches in some locations. Yeah. We don't have multiple breaches in other locations, and some pods are doing more than one. Breach. Like right. three breaches in this in a close proximity, one pod does. That, so there'll be one yeah. pod and they'll probably be progressively moving it up together. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Have you got a timeline on, on the major breaches? Uh, not with me. I think the best way to address this is as at the next uh, recovery meeting. Okay. Uh, we actually do a bit of an in depth presentation on where each of them are at, uh, what the longer term view is. Um, and in the interim, we do three reports, of, uh, three updates a week that we can um, distribute. Because definitely the community is constantly asking. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Good. It's good to know for them as well that we're doing the main. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? No, they're out. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Chris. Kerry. Um, I'm happy to move uh, this paper. Um, second, Councillor Williams. All those who agree, say aye. aye. Those who are against, carried. Kilda, thank you very much. Um, our last public item is a discussion of minor items, which we have Councillor Roadley around servicing our outer reach region, parts of the region. I'll try not to make it too much of a tongue twister. Um, just um, would like to... Um, put on the table, there, there appears to be a growing tide of discontent um, out of Wairo, and some of that is being, um, I'm hearing as I travel around the district, but also is being furnished through our um, Wairo Star, um, and uh, with inputs from His Worship Craig Mayor, <laughs> uh, Craig Little, the Mayor. Um, and so my question is, or my um, uh, what I want to put on the table is, are we as an organisation well um, furnished to support our wider regions? And if so, why is there this perception? And it does seem to be an enduring perception, uh, rightly or wrongly. Um, so why does that exist over a long time? And I'm speaking before the cyclone, yep. and that has been exasperated um, given the impacts of the cyclone. And if we are, uh, well, if we are, why does it exist? And if we're not, how do we focus or create a focus to remedy that mm -hmm. uh, so that the people, particularly in Wairo, but also all our other um, remote communities are well serviced by this organisation? Thank you, Councillor Roadley. Uh, with our minor items, it, it is usually voicing the concerns and views and perspectives, so thank you for doing that on behalf of the constituency in Wairau. Um, what we can do with that is take that into further discussion um, in, in a workshop fashion uh, to, to try and um, identify uh, what can be remediated um, at a later date. But thank you for bringing that to our attention. Kia ora. Kapoi koutou. Um, we are going to head into public excluded uh, for a short time. Um, so I'm happy to move that we head into public excluded. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Williams, all those who agree, say aye. Aye. Those against, carried. Kia ora.